Hey, how are you guys doing? You know, it's great if, uh, you know, the podcasters or anybody who is creating content can interact directly without any intermediaries uh, with their peers, with their followers, with their subscribers, with their own audience and, you know, and have, uh, and have them paid uh, in Bitcoin uh, over Lightning peer to peer without any intermediaries. So without further ado, I'm really excited to have Jimbo back on my show. He's not only the author of Orange Coin Good, the value of Bitcoin, which you can buy on Amazon, but he's uh, you know, very technically advanced and knowledgeable and can break things down for the average user, you know, the why, the purpose, uh, the features, the operation, how you set up things. So it's not going to go into like, uh, you know, it's not going to be a classical tutorial, but we're going to you know really dive deep into the uh the purpose and the questions and common issues of sphinx chat uh, join them in the telegram group if you have any questions but for now hope you're going to enjoy this episode this guide tutorial with jimbo and let me know what you think jimbo welcome to the show thanks for your time uh you, I already had the pleasure to have you on my show like a long time ago. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm not up to date. Uh, have you already published your your book yet? Uh, my first book, yeah, Orange Coin Good. It's okay. It's out and available. Yeah. I haven't read it to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's yet. fair. Almost nobody has. It's okay. <laughs> so yeah, and it would be interesting what the feedback is from the readers. Um, isn't. Uh, a whole lot of feedback that I've gotten. I mean, a few um, a few Bitcoiners that I know uh, said it was good. And from my own personal experience, from the no coin, my goal was to try to help pre-coiners understand the Bitcoin value proposition. And I feel like I've done that for the people who have read it. So, um, you know, I don't have a whole lot of reviews um, per se, but I think the people who read it have liked it. Probably pleasantly surprised given that it came from... Uh, relative nobody all right okay well i'm looking forward to reading but you know it's just uh the day is just 24 hours it's it's it's, it's like so much time pressure at the moment um so jimbo um i know you're you know you're pretty let's say compared to other average users you're pretty technically advanced i would say you know or or knowledgeable let's just say you know um so what we want to talk about is you know this uh, this sphinx can you describe like what is sphinx what's the purpose uh what do you do with sphinx how do you connect it how do you set it up uh what, what what's the purpose of, of sphinx Sure, that's a great question. So let me uh, preface my commentary by saying I've been using Sphinx for about three or four weeks, which makes me a global world expert at Sphinx uh, com compared to compared to most. And I've been doing a lot of reading of the code um, because I've been trying to write my own uh, bot basically for it. But um, so let's start with what is Sphinx. So Sphinx, uh, at a high level, you could call it a chat application. It, it's another chat. Uh, service, you could think of it in the same category, roughly as something like Signal or Telegram, in the sense that it's a, a chat service. Um, the key differentiating feature for Sphinx that is relevant to your audience, I guess, that rather than communicating over regular internet channels, TCP to somebody's central server, in Sphinx, you communicate over the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network the, the Bitcoin Lightning Network has this feature called a key send, um, which is where using somebody's public key of their Lightning node, you can send them a payload of text. So Sphinx uses that feature for its communication. So instead of communicating uh, with a trusted third party server, uh, you're making connections over the Lightning peer to peer network. And those uh, communications are all um, encrypted end to end. So even the communications that go through um, a brokering server, which I can talk about um, for, for the purpose of a tribe, which is like a chat room, uh, even those messages are encrypted um, end to end. So it's an end to end encrypted uh, text based chat protocol um, built on the Lightning Network. All right, uh, that sounds great. Sounds great. I think that's that's pretty clear um, for for you know the average uh, let's say you know beginner. Um, sorry if you hear my baby crying in the background. So, 
Um, yeah, so uh, so you, listen, I mean, I managed to set up my, my Sphinx uh, on Android with Orbot. Uh, I don't, you know, I had already downloaded, installed Orbot. So that was that was a piece of cake, more or less. The only problem uh, to be concrete, you know, I have a MyNode uh, and it has an integrated, you know, Sphinx relay. So uh, the, that's the, that's the the desktop version of Windows doesn't work. And you know, I I, I contacted the admins and uh, and you know the team of Sphinx, and they said they're working on it. The developers are working on it. There, you know, there's some bugs or some kind of you know potential improvements that need to be made. And that's why you know I can't if I I can open it up, you know, but I don't see any of the tribes it doesn't work and it's not connecting it's not connecting to my sphinx really so there's a lot of you know issues um specifically in my case you know with uh with the desktop version on windows so do you what kind of common issues do you see problems or you know from the average users in the telegram group uh, you want to talk about that maybe a little sure so um i think i saw your one screenshot where you showed uh your windows client with nothing showing like no no right. chats or anything showing um i can talk about that before before i answer your questions though i wanted to ask you one question i um i don't do a whole lot with android so what is and how does that how does that work well, i'm sorry you got broken up a little bit what was the question oh i'm sorry orbot you mentioned orbot what's yeah. that yeah, well, Orbot um, is. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a techie, but it's, isn't that like a mobile version of Tor, uh, where you have, you know, you can go into, you can just in, download, install it, and then once you once you're inside Orbot on your Android, you can go into settings or into that, you know, rotating wheel, and then it shows you all the applications that you have, and then you can just, you know, check mark it or or deactivate it or whatever, but it needs to be activated. So for example, in, in case of Sphinx, you know, there's a check mark and then I go into VPN bridge or something like that, or you activate the VPN button and then you just go on start and just starts automatically and it bootstraps itself and connects whatever, however. Um, but then, you know, then I can open up Sphinx on my Android and it, uh, and it connects, you know? Okay. It's like Orbot then is a proxy that allows you to access a uh, Tor onion routed node of some sort, but using but um, applications that want to speak regular HTTP, they talk to Orbot and then Orbot proxies those requests and sends them out over onion. That sounds like to me roughly what that, it is. That sounds, yeah, that sounds pretty correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I don't know a whole lot about Orbot. But that makes sense. Okay, so you mentioned my node um, as like where you run the relay. So let me. Um, you have questions. You asked me what are the common problems, and you asked about uh, about the relay. So when you run Sphinx, there are two things that you need as as a user of Sphinx. One thing you need is the app, and you need to either run it on Android or iOS, or as you mentioned, there's a Windows build. Um, you can run a uh, what's called Electron. Um, Electron is a Node.js uh, encapsulating build system of sorts. It's probably what they use to build the Windows client. So if you download the source code, so for example, have run a desktop client on my Ubuntu main by building and compiling the Electron target, right? So that's another possibility. But I think the, the code base uses, um, it's kind of the same code base. So on, on um, GitHub, the Sphinx Android project has the code for the Android app and also has the code for this Electron thing and probably has the code for the, the Windows app as well. So you need to run a client. That's one thing you need. <clears throat> and then the other thing you need is to run a relay. And the job of the relay is to talk to your LND uh, Lightning node. So <clears throat> the Lightning network has a couple of different implementations. The one that Sphinx Relay works with is called LND. So you need to be running an LND Lightning node. Um, home node uh, implementations like my node run LND, and so therefore you can connect your Sphinx relay. So my node, the way I understand my node is it has a bunch of different applications you can enable. One of the applications you can enable is Sphinx relay. If you enable it, it will talk to your LND service, which is also on your my node. Your my node by default will expose a Tor service 
and not a regular old HTTP, you know, HTTP service. So in order to reach your MyNode from your Android device, if your MyNode is only exposed through Tor, you need a bridge. And that's what Orbot does. So Orbot provides a Tor connection that then your Sphinx client running on your Android device can connect to. I know I'm probably going <laughs> too fast with all this stuff. Um, so yeah, so you need to be able to run a Sphinx relay. In my case, my LND node is running uh, through BTC Pay Server. So BTC Pay Server is another, like my node, it's, um, it's a collection of applications, one of which is LND. Um, Umbral, I believe, is also a collection of applications, one of which is LND, and you can run Sphinx that way as well. You could always, of course, just download the Sphinx relay code and run it on a regular um, system that is also running LND, but it's pretty popular these days for most folks to use some sort of bundling technology, um, whether it's MyNode, Umbral, uh, BTC Pay Server, or something else. So what are the common problems? So you mentioned having a connection issue. I have seen some people have some connection issues. Oh, let me say one more thing. So while you do need two things, you need a client application and a relay, you don't have to uh, run your own relay. You could go through uh, stack work. So if you go to sphinx.chat, they have an option where you can pay on Lightning to basically rent space on one of their nodes. So they run a, a hosted um, Sphinx relay for you that you can connect to and your application connects to that instead. Um, they have another option, which is like a, a dedicated node of sorts, but I think they're currently out of, out of stock of those. Um, but those would allow you to create tribes. Uh, so what are the common problems? So you mentioned connection issues. So yes, of course, if you're running your own Sphinx relay from your own, uh, say my node, and it's only connection to the outside world is through Tor, then you have the problem of needing to proxy somehow your client's requests through to Tor. So on Android, you use Orbot, which is seeing the HTTP requests over to over to your um, Tor network. If you're running the Windows client, you'll have the same requirement, which is somehow my Windows client needs to proxy its HTTP requests over into over into Tor. So I, I don't know one would go about doing that. I don't I don't use uh, Windows, but if your my node is on the same local network and your Windows computer on your same local network, there may be a way to um, there may be a way to change the URL so that you're just talking to it over your same like LAN inside your house, for example. But uh, I, don't, I don't know of any exposed configuration where you could do that. Yeah, the problem is I think, you know, for uh, average users, uh, um, they would, you know, I think it's necessary to have some specific like use case tutorials. For example, you know, people who have MyNode or other whatever, uh, uh, operative systems or, or windows, uh, you know, to, to guide them like step by step. And maybe that is one of the reasons, you know, a lot of people like myself, you know, just, just fail at it because, because it's, it's a little bit over my, you know, leak. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I go to my node and I go into info of Sphinx relay, uh, I can tell you, you know, what it says, for example. Um, it says ensure that Sphinx Relay is enabled and you see running on the status tile. I I do see that. Uh, download and install Sphinx from Sphinx.chat. Paste the connection string into the Sphinx application. Sphinx should now be connected to your own node. So, um, I'm already, you know, I'm already connected via Android, you know, as mentioned before. Um, and I already tried, you know, to paste that connection string, but um, it's somehow, I don't know, for whatever reasons, it it's not connecting because, uh, as you said, you know, I mean, I already have the LND active and it's running. So, so, so let, me, let me pause and ask you a question. So when you say the connection string, how long is this connection string? Is it like super long or is it just like medium long? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, the reason why I ask is because when you first start up a Sphinx relay or when you sign up with, with Sphinx.chat, they give you or your relay will create a relatively short um, connection token, 
right? That's a one-time use token. And once you use that one-time use token, you set up your user account. You set up your owner account with that relay. Right. So if you have your own relay on your MyNode and it gave you a token and you pasted it into your Android and you succeeded in connecting to over Orbot to your MyNode to create your account, that's it. That token is now used. And so if you try to paste that same token into your Windows machine, even if it could proxy and make a connection, it's going to reject it on the grounds that that token has already been used. But what you can do is you can restore. So on your Android device, um, somewhere in the menu system, there's the ability to back up keys. And it will give you a very long, uh, this is a technical term, base64 encoded, a very long jumble of letters and numbers. That big, long, huge jumble of letters and numbers contains your private key, your public key, the URL to your MyNode, and um, there was another piece of information. Oh yeah, a special token that your client will use to communicate. If you restore on your Windows device, you like restore from that, it'll, it'll ask you for your PIN because it needs to decrypt all of this information. And you put in the same PIN that you used on your Android device, it'll decrypt it, and then it'll connect the same way. So if you're using the same initial code, that initial signup code will only work once. But what you can do is you can use the backup keys to restore the same account on multiple devices. But uh, don't you risk like losing if you restore it, uh, like losing all your your tribes, anything, everything else? Aren't there some issues like with restoring it? I'm not sure if that's a great. That, yeah, that's a great question. So um, this is where having your own relay makes a difference. So well, I mean having a relay. So the client is, for lack of a better word, it's, it's dumb. You know, the client is just showing you what your relay knows. The relay is responsible for actually communicating over the lightning network, keeping track of all your tribes, keeping track of your messages, which messages you've seen, all of that stuff is on your relay. And then the client is just a dumb client. That's like showing you and letting you click things and letting, and, and letting you write text, but it's the relay that's doing all the work, including storing what has been seen before. So restoring to another device, um, doesn't risk really anything. The only thing that you could potentially lose would be if your client, like if you had tried to send a message and failed, mm -hmm. right. For connection reasons or something, obviously that message that you typed and were never able to send that only lives on your device. So that would not be restorable because you had never sent it. But if you succeeded in sending a message, the relay has a record of that message. And then when you restore it on another client, it'll ask the relay like, hey, what are all my messages? And it'll download them up to 5,000 or so. So it'll restore from the relay. Okay, gotcha. Are you, um, let me just ask you something else. Are you using Sphinx like on a regular basis or what are you using Sphinx for? Like. <laughs> Sure. So um, I'm not in a whole lot of rooms. I, I made one tribe with my relay that has only basically me in it. Um, I'm in one room with uh, some other plebs and we, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of action going on, but I have been posting updates in my, uh, in my, um, my journey to try to understand the, the Sphinx architecture. Uh, and then I'm in the planet Sphinx like main tribe. And that, that has people joining because it's the first tribe you join and so people are joining it and saying hi and whatnot um, there's a few questions there um, so that's about all i use it for what i had set out to do initially was i wanted to write a bot so in the sphinx architecture there's this concept of a bot and when you when you first set up um your relay uh there's this there's a couple of built-in bots one of the built-in bots is called mom or mother bot and if you just in your own you make a tribe on your own relay and then you're in there as the owner you can say slash bot um, like help and it'll give you information. The mother bot will tell you what she can do. Uh, you can say slash bot search, and then you can search for whatever bots there, there are. There's not that many bots out there. Um, there's a, there's a BTC bot, which gives you like price updates. And there's uh, one that gives you like random number facts called num. Um, and that's about it as far as bots go. So what I thought I wanted to do was write a bot, <clears throat> but um, it turns out that I don't think bots have the, capabilities of what I want to do. So what I'm really doing now basically is writing a client library uh, in Node.js so that I can write a, a bot, quote unquote, you know, people, people listening to this won't be able to see me doing air quotes, but so I can write a bot, but really it's just a, a regular user that happens to be automated. Um, to me, that seems to be the really cool feature of Sphinx. So 
I mean, if, if you, if I don't know how much time you have, but if I, if I can just like <laughs> rant a little bit. So in the, in the early days of the web, uh, everything was text-based, right? So uh, you had like Usenet groups, you had email, and that was about it, right? And some people were like, this is revolutionary. And other people were like, you know, this is going to be like fax machines, <clears throat> Paul Krugman. Um, but anyway, so you, all you had was text. And then over the course of the, of the history of the internet, we got better privacy. We got, uh, you know, secure socket layer connections. We got HTTPS instead of just HTTP. We got... Um, more rich media content. First, it was images. Uh, you, some of your listeners might remember those old like um, progressive JPEGs where like your internet was so slow that like you'd, you'd see part of a JPEG image before the rest of it eventually came into focus. <laughs> so we had, we, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's how slow the internet used to be. And then eventually we got music and then eventually video and it continues to get better. So what's really super exciting to me about Sphinx is I had been a little bit interested in Lightning Network, but I don't really do that many payments on Lightning. So it wasn't a super high priority for me. But what's what's awesome about Sphinx is that it's it's the first application that I've seen where they've been able to make a foothold into people's devices, iPhone, and Android, but using the Lightning Network for communication. So we're back to text. So it's like, we're back to the early web. We're back to like Usenet and email with text. But this time it's built on end-to-end -end encrypted secure, you know, security, onion routed, right? And using the finest monetary medium ever created. And because money is built in, it solves all kinds of problems that have plagued the internet since its inception. So in the early days of email, it wasn't, you know, maybe like a few months of email before the first spam messages started being sent. And it's been a problem ever since. Well, Sphinx solves the problem of spam by just making it costly. So you can have a tribe where it costs a few sats to send a message right? And then it just becomes prohibitively expensive to spam. You can also set up what's called, uh, they, they, they call it stake, which I think is a bad name. In the API, it's actually called escrow. And the way escrow works is when you send a message, you also have to put up some number of sats, which then you get back if the moderator doesn't flag it as spam after some timeout. So let's say you're setting up a tribe. You could say, okay, it costs one sat to send a message, but you have to put up a hundred sats every time you make a message which you'll get after 12 hours if no moderator has marked it as spam. So then if a spammer comes in and sends a whole bunch of messages, real money, like they've just lost money to send all that spam. It gets marked as spam. The moderator removes it. Nobody else has to ever look at it. Meanwhile, that person paid money and they get nothing out of it, right? So <clears throat> Sphinx solves the problem of spam uh, directly by just making it too costly to do. Like you, there's no... There's no trying to figure out, is this a real person or is it a bot? It's like, if you're making something that's spammy, you lose the money that you spent on trying to send that message. And so to me, that's super exciting and why I wanted to do bots, because we have this opportunity now where you could write an automated person, like a, a bot that you interact with, and that bot can accept payment from your Sphinx, right? And so then it can offer some service, right, uh, of various description. And then... Um, you could just DM with a bot that you pay to do something and then, you know, go about your business. The bot doesn't need to know who you are. You don't care that much about the bot. And it's just uh, like a direct payment type type situation. It It's almost like the very beginnings of a better um, Amazon web services. So like when you have an Amazon web service, you have an account with Amazon. They have your credit card on file. You pay for some you pay for some services, they give you service, and then they bill you monthly, right? But you have to set up all of this relationship in order to get that service. Thanks, right? And with Lightning, you can have a web service that somebody wants and disappears. And that's it. And everybody's happy. The person got what they wanted. They pay as they go. You know, you got paid. Everybody's happy. So to me, that's it's super exciting um, as like a, a beginning new wave of internet that... Um, breaks a lot of the assumptions of the old internet, that it's hard to make payments. And so therefore payments happen in batches. You end up getting captured by large companies because it's so hard to set up your payment account. Like this is why Amazon gets all of your business because like I could buy something from some other random website, but now I got to get out my credit card. I got to put in my credit card information. I don't know who this person is, blah, blah, blah. It's a big pain. Right. But if I just go to Amazon, they already have all that information. So it's just one click and I'm done. Right. But now we have that same possibility uh, using the Lightning Network, you can just pay quickly. They just click and be done. Um, and so Sphinx to me represents the next step along the path that 
creates a new internet for pay as you go, basically. Yeah, Sorry, it's really yeah, finished. it's really groundbreaking because you know for the first time you know uh, content creators are you know people who really what whatever they do whatever kind of content they produce or or information they provide or you know they finally have the chance to be fairly you know compensated peer to peer right I mean that's essentially what right yeah yeah no. Yeah, that's that's super smart. So that's another thing that I think the Sphinx team, the Stackwork team, is kind of on is uh, helping podcasters, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. To your point, yeah. if you're making, yeah, if you're making, if you're making a podcast, like, what are your options for for turning that into an income stream? Well, typically, it's advertising, right? You sell attention, and everybody pays with their attention. Everybody pays with their attention. I mean, even the expression to pay attention, like, it's built into our it's built into our language that. Uh, attention is something that you pay. You don't wish to give it up, but you give it up, you know, kind of begrudgingly. We pay attention. So people pay with their attention, but yes, using Lightning, we now have the option of pay as you go and it's easy and you can try something out and pay a little bit and the content creator makes a little money and you're happy or you're not and you, you know, decide to keep listening or you don't. Um, so that's that's super, that's uh, a super cool uh, feature. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that Sphinx is the Sphinx team, the Stackwork team, is dug down on supporting podcasters because that's um, what's it called? That's a uh, that's a virtuous cycle, right? If you support podcasters, then podcasters come over and then they talk about the great things about how Sphinx helps them podcast, and then Sphinx gets marketing, yeah, uh, kind of by default by being the vehicle by which podcasters can can get started. So yeah. it's really smart of them, in my opinion, to uh, yeah. No, they have really they've really created something uh, unique. Uh, so let me, uh, you know, for the sake of clarity, um, before the my battery goes off on my on my mobile, let me, you know, maybe for the for the listeners. So, so I, you know, I activated Orbot. I I turned on, you know, Sphinx. I can enter, you know, no no problem. It connects, and sometimes, you know, the Orbot uh, just deactivates itself. Then you need to go inside again and then start over. But usually it works. <laughs> Um, so let me see if this works. Uh, so Orbot is, is almost finished bootstrapping. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it, it, it's a little bit slower. I don't know if, what is it? Is it bandwidth issues or whatever? So, okay. So, um, I'll go back into, into Sphinx and then it rotates looking for connection and it should within few seconds now it's connected it's green okay the this this um thunder thing whatever this this symbol is green so it's connected now i'm 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 gonna go into the left uh you know upper corner and you know and and um go into the sort of the dashboard it says dashboard contacts profile is that what you meant like on profile there's basic and advanced and there's my name in basic and then there's some kind of you know long string i don't know how long and then in advanced there's a server url um so basically i mean if i theoretically if i if i just copy and paste the server is that the server url that i could put theoretically into the this desktop windows you know sphinx version or is it in basic, you know, the, you know, under my name, there's a name, you know, the name of the, of the, of my Sphinx. Uh, and, and there's a, you know, a long, whatever connection string or something like that is if I take that and put it into windows, uh, it should, it should connect. Right. I mean, all right. So let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, so I, I'm opening up my own so I can follow along. So let's go to profile. Um, under profile, what I see is username and address and route hint. Is that the same stuff you see in basic or is yours different? If you go on profile, if I go on profile, I see my name, a logo, and then it says basic uh, or I can click on advanced. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you scroll way down to the bottom of basic, there's an option that says your key or something like that. Want to switch devices? Export keys. What do you mean that? On the very bottom. Yeah, on mine, it, on the very very bottom of basic. On mine, it says sync more devices. You know, back up your key. 
it probably says something a little different on the Android device. I know they were trying to get an update to the to the iOS device, which I don't think has been pushed out yet. So what I might be seeing might be a little older than yours, but somewhere at the way bottom there, there's probably something where it's where you can back up your key. There's probably a button or something, something about backing up and something about keys or syncing more devices. Okay. Uh, what kind of version do you have on your, like, what, what, can I see, like, uh, where can I check where, you know, what version I, oh, it says here, oh, version 86. I don't know what it means, but I guess that's the last one. That's the last version I had, you know, installed um, on my Android. It says version 86. Does it say any version on yours? Um, let me see under, like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't see a version on mine. You know, but when it's okay. You, so, when you click on those like three lines, you know the, the three uh, horizontal mm -hmm. lines next to profile. Yeah. Um, it says somewhere you know below add friend and tribe plus tribe. It says version eighty six. Mine has version, but that might be a feature of oh the iOS version. Like it okay. just doesn't say. Said, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why I don't see it, and you and you do. So so at the way bottom of your um, actually, let me see if I can. Uh, so I'm running the Electron version on my desktop. Let me see. Let me see what the menu system looks like on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, on the on the Electron version, it's even it's even less less stuff. Um, yeah, I don't see a way to I don't see a way to find the, the profile or whatever. But anyway, let's let's talk about yours again. So at the way bottom of basic, is there something about keys? Can you read me what that said again? It just says want to switch devices, export keys. Export keys. So what happens when you click that? Huh? Excuse me? What happens when you click? What happens when you click uh, or tap the export keys option? It, it let okay, it's asking me for my pin again. Um hmm. no, nothing. <laughs> It just, I don't know, it, it closes itself and then I have to put on, uh, I have to enter the pin again. Oh, export keys copied. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So, it, so what it just copied to your clipboard, Yeah. right? It just copied to your clipboard, a big, long bunch of text. It's not going to show it to you, but if you go to some oh, other application on your it somewhere, Android. Yeah. It's a very, very long connection, uh, whatever, some kind of code. Yep. string. Yeah. Yes. So what that is, that is a base 64 encoded payload for lack of a better word and inside of it is an encrypted data structure that includes everything that your client needs to do its connecting it includes the url that you were just talking about in the, in uh -huh. the advanced menu and it also includes um your private and public key pair your rsa keys that that your uh that your client uses for end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. And that blob also includes uh, what's called a, um, a user token, which is uh, just a very small amount of information that your client uses to talk to the relay uh -huh. to verify that it's you. Okay. So that, that blob that it copied to your clipboard, if you go into your Windows client, you might have to like, I don't know, yeah, uninstall the Windows up. client. I just or like, the, the Windows version of Sphinx Chat and uh let me just see if uh, i mean it's the latest version anyway but um okay i got it open now for me um i mean i could even actually show you is it already show is it already showing panels like you've already logged in and stuff yeah can you see it yeah so what we need to do somehow and i don't know how to do this on on windows but yeah. somehow we need to forget like log out like we need to forget who you are uh -huh. right okay like, I don't know if it's remove account, maybe. Like, if you do remove account from this computer that was in the edit menu, that might be how you log out. Oh, okay. Because so, whatever whatever you use to log in is not working, so we're just going to remove the account because we need to paste that stuff you just had, that backup key. Okay, all right. Oh, yes. Gotcha. So here it says enter code. That's where you paste that stuff from Android into that enter code box, which you should not put on the video stream. So you should no. stop screen sharing <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, gotcha. before you do this. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. So let me let me just stop it for a while. And I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. I can't see your screen anymore. Okay. I'll I'll you know I'll try it if if it works if you know wonderful if it's what, what, <clears throat> yeah what should happen when you paste that 
that big long bunch of junk in that box is it should prompt you for your pin right? yeah that pin is how it's the encryption key your pin is basically the encryption key for that backup file I see that big long string you just copied is effectively an encrypted backup of your crucial information mm -hmm. that you need to connect and is the encryption key that is encrypting that file. Right. So, uh, so somehow you need to get that, that piece of data from your Android device over into your windows machine, paste it in there. It'll mm -hmm. prompt you for your pin. You put in the same pin you used for Android behind the scenes that will decrypt the file and then it will connect. It'll try to connect. What I believe it'll try to do is it'll try to connect to your Orbot. It'll try to connect to your Orbot, which it'll fail to do because your Orbot is running on your Android device. Oh, I see. But, yeah. one, but once we get to that step, that's when you can go into the advanced menu, hopefully. And in the advanced menu, you can specify a different URL yeah. right, to your Sphinx reload from within your house. That'll be like HTTPS, you know, 192.168.1. whatever, wherever your my node is on your internal network. Mm -hmm. That would okay, be my I guess. Just, I, I managed to, yeah, I managed to send it by email and uh, I just pasted this long string into that field that you told me to. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I had to, you know, enter my pin. So it's, okay, it's opened the, the Sphinx chat window again. Um, and it still should show nothing. It shows nothing, right? It shows nothing, yeah. And the reason it shows nothing is because the URL is the one to your Orbot, probably. So there's probably a way in the edit menu or something where you, you need to get to that same advanced screen that you were looking at on your Android. I don't know how to do it in the Windows thing. Oh, I uh, see. Maybe it's maybe it's under profile. Mm -hmm. Edit profile. Profile. Advanced. Yeah. Um, see the server URL there? That's probably your Orbot on your own machine, but that uh -huh. URL will need to be something else in order to talk to your MyNode. Like, however you access your MyNode from your house. How, how do you access your MyNode from your house? Is it like an HTTPS uh, URL? Uh, yeah, because I'm usually not home. I'm, I'm, you know, I just, I access it via Tor the browser, you know, so. so. So what you may need is the equivalent of Orbot, but for Windows. So I don't know what that is because I don't use Windows, but there might be an equivalent for Orbot for Windows, which is like creates a local host HTTPS connection that allows you to proxy requests over Tor. So whatever the equivalent of Orbot is for Windows, that's what you should do. Uh, that's what you should do. And then that would allow you hopefully to put in a local host URL, mm -hmm. right? Okay. You, you'll end up with a URL that's like HTTPS colon slash slash local host colon port, whatever your proxy port is slash something. And then that will proxy requests over Tor. I see. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I just don't know. Like you're at the, you're at the limit of my knowledge about proxying requests over Tor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a little bit above my pay grade. Um, so, yeah, I'll have to, maybe I'll, you know, ask, do you think the, the these guys, the, the team of Sphinx, I mean, because they wanted to work on it or the developers to, to make it a little bit more user-friendly for, you know, for folks like myself or, or, you know, for the average user out there. So I'm going to get some well, feedback, hopefully. Yeah. 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 The, the way to make it easier, the, the, the thing that they could do to make it easier would be to have the client be able to connect to Tor, um, to, to Tor services. So yeah. like I said, the, today, the relay today, the client code connects to a relay over HTTPS, mm -hmm. right? Regular old HTTPS is how it connects. That's, that's the, that's the, how do I say it? That's the, um, that's the API that I'm using in my development uh, in my development goals. For people whose no whose relay nodes are only accessible over Tor, they need some way to bridge from the client to Tor. The simplest way for an end user to do that would be for the Sphinx application to just natively connect to Tor, and then there'd be no need for setting up a proxy. The fact that on Android you need an Orbot in order to proxy the connections over Tor is something they should fix by incorporating that into the application itself. That, and that shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, I mean, they have been working on it for some time now. I mean, what, what, what do you think is the challenge here or, you know, to make it just 
you know, just user more user friendly and more accessible. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually don't know. I've never, I've never tried to have an application connect directly to Tor. Right. So I, I don't know what's involved. Um, presumably, yeah. So there's a getting the code that can talk to Tor in some way, like that can that can connect to Tor and like route things through Tor. There's getting that code, and there's connecting to that code from your application. So if it's Android, how do I connect my Android code that it's written in JavaScript or whatever? Mm -hmm. How do I connect that to the to the Tor bridge code? And then there's of course packaging all that together into an APK so that it can be de deployed to Android devices. And mm -hmm. there's packaging all that same stuff up for iOS. And there's packaging all that same stuff up for Windows. So, <clears throat> for example, let's just, let's let's back up a little bit from the Tor part and talk about a different part of the architecture. So as I mentioned, everything is end-to-end -end encrypted, right? So <clears throat> everything is end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that the client needs to be able to encrypt messages and decrypt messages that it receives. So when, you're, so when your client receives a message, what it receives is encrypted and it needs to decrypt that message so that you, you can read it. It doesn't travel over the wall plain text. It travels encrypted. And then for if you and I were having a DM in order for my Sphinx to write a message to you, I need your public key. And then once I have your public key, my node encrypts a message that only you can decrypt because you have your private key. Okay, so there's like this encryption decryption that needs to occur. Mm -hmm. Android has libraries for doing that, right? Code libraries for doing that, right? And JavaScript. Um, so your Windows, your Windows client effect. What it is is it's basically a browser. It's running an elect electron, but the encryption code doesn't run in the browser. It runs in a separate process. Mm -hmm. So your Windows, your Windows application is really two things. It's running the thing you look at, the Electron browser-like interface. And behind the scenes, it's running a service which can asynchronously do the encryption and decryption for you. <laughs> and then all of that's packaged together then as a Windows service for you. Meanwhile, on Android, on Android, it has its own interface, which is um, like React Native. Right, so it, it's got a, a, a browser-like interface, but then instead of talking to an asynchronous Node.js-based service, it's using Android native encryption APIs in order okay. to do the decryption. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I understand so what all I'm you're trying saying. to say is, have yeah. you have you ever tried like suggesting these ideas or proposals to the developer team or to the team of Sphinx or whoever is working in the background? You know, I think it's a very constructive thing you you know you're proposing here. Uh, you know, maybe you can help them, like, you know, at least give them a, a, a some kind of inspiration or, or or a guidance, you know, on how to how to fix this whole issue, you know, so that uh, you know we don't we don't see so many common issues in in the Telegram group and people, you know, struggling with all kinds of things, especially if you're not technically, um, you know, very knowledgeable. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like I said, I mean. The, the the actual solution to incorporate Tor connectivity directly into the app so that just like an app today has relatively easy access to web APIs, it's relatively easy in almost any programming language to hit a URL, like hit this URL, get me back some results. Right. That's easy to do. It's baked into everything. It's easy to do in Python. There's libraries for it. It's easy to do in JavaScript. Like everybody's got this, this kind of nailed down. What is not currently nailed down is the easy ability to make Tor requests to open up onion addresses on a random application. So people need to have separate libraries for that, or maybe it's asynchronous or they have to run a separate service. In your case, you were talking about Orbot, you know, as like a, a bridge. So the fact that Orbot exists is evidence that this is not easy to do, right? Orbot wouldn't have to exist if it was easy for everybody to just incorporate onion routed requests into their into their apps. The fact that people have to fall back on the crutch of using Orbot is evidence of how hard it is still to do that kind of work. I don't know why it's hard. I haven't looked into it myself, um, you know. But I mean, the Sphinx team is probably busy. They got a lot of stuff going on. Like I said before earlier, they're they're um, they seem to be really supporting um, podcasting. 
So I suspect there's probably work going on to like make the streaming of podcasts, you know, more seamless and whatnot. Yeah, that's that's um, super interesting for myself. I mean, from my perspective, this is, you know, my personal, uh, you, that would be my personal use case. I mean, I already, you know, have uh, somehow managed, you know, to connect it with podcast index and, 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 you know, have it listed on Breeze, you know, all those things, but it's still, you know, the, like, uh, have everything like converge into one that would be like the the the, the opt you know the 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 best solution uh, to, to to this whole issue with with podcasting you know you have a podcast you have a you have one string and then every, everything is interoperable and and compatible and i think this is what's somehow missing in uh, in in the podcast sphere <clears throat> yeah i don't know i, I I think I think the podcasting thing is is super relevant, and I hope they fix it. With regards to um, the tour stuff, I don't know. On <laughs> using a Windows client, I don't think is really their um, main use case. I think that they're. I think um, the Sphinx team probably mainly is targeting Android and iOS. Mm -hmm. um, for folks who are whose nodes are only usable over Tor, I mean, you're kind of. It's interesting you mentioned because like the user who is able to run their home node over onion and set up a sphinx relay is already a certain level of technical sophistication right yeah like so you know they they they're already pretty far down the technical sophistication rabbit hole like um making it easier for them to do tor is uh connecting from their client is obviously good mm -hmm. you know but how many users fall into that bucket right that are that are tech savvy enough and privacy conscious enough to run their own relay only accessible over Tor, but then also need help running a proxy. Yeah, that's so like, it's, it's just too overwhelming. You know, I'm just I'm just you know I'm just empathizing. I mean, I would say you know I'm a pretty let's say relatively more advanced and more experienced. You know, with all the technical details. I mean, it's it's already a challenge for people. You know, setting up a node and 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 you know. Uh, you know, the, the updates and upgrades are usually out, pretty much automatic, you know, uh, and uh, I think it, if, if, you know, if this whole, if the whole operation, the features become a little bit more user friendly, that would be, that would be just great. You know, that would be just, uh, you know, exponentially great for, 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 you know, the average podcaster, let's just say, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard and it's also a process. So, um, you know, when Linux first came out, it was just a kernel. And then eventually people came up with distros. You'll probably remember maybe 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of different competing distros. You could get Slackware or you could get um, Gentoo or you could get, you know, Debian or you could get Red Hat the, or Mandrake. There were all these different Linux distros. And the whole, you know, at that time it was hard, you know, to, to like run a distro and figure out how to do your package management and all this stuff. And then it got easier and easier and there were fewer of them and, you know, it kind of solidified. Um, in the early days of Bitcoin, there was really just the Bitcoin client. There was that, that was it. There was like Bitcoin core and that was all there was. And then over time, there's been a pr proliferation of different um, software and services. You know, miners run their own special hardware. They run their own special software. They run their own special software to coordinate fleets and mining pools. Then you have like all these different proliferation of wallets, right? There's There yeah. used to be for a long time, it was just Bitcoin Core and then there was Electrum. So now there's like two things, right? There was right. Arm, Armory, which nobody uses anymore. Mm -hmm. But then now there's like Sparrow, which knows how to talk to Electrum's backend. There's multiple implementations of Electrum's backend, right? There's not just Electrum Server. There's yeah. Electrum X and Electors, right? There's Electrum personal server back end. You can run Spectre front end, right? There's Spectre's hardware wall. It's like there's just yeah, yeah. So there's all it's this proliferation. True, you know, they're all user friendly, pretty much user friendly. I did a, a episode with Economy Alchemist on Sparrow, and uh, I did you know a couple of them with Ben Kaufman. I think these are great you know uh, uh, tools. You know that finally you know the Bitcoin beginner or the noob can can can. Uh, can apply and you know use them instantaneously. Yeah, so to me it's like to me it's just like Linux. So you had Linux and then you had a whole bunch of tools built up around Linux mm -hmm. and it was like man getting these tools to all work together is really hard. I need a distro. So then we had a proliferation of distros 
right? And then it became easier to run a distro, okay? So we had Bitcoin, then we had a proliferation of different Bitcoin related software, which was the world we now live in, to the point where it's like, man, I really need a distro. And that's what my node is. That's what Umbral is. That's what BTC pay server is. They're basically Bitcoin distros that come with all the services bundled right. together. Exactly. But yeah. we're but we're still in like the 2005, like, do I go with Slackware or do I go with Debian or like, how do I deal with these package conflicts? That's the world we live in now, but in Bitcoin land. Five or 10 years from now, we'll have very smooth distros where everything just works out of the box. It's like, yeah. you know, the Synaptic Package Manager, one click, like install the thing and then it works, right? Yeah. So to me, it's a process and we're kind of in the middle of that process. And as a result, yeah, there's going to be some pain, um, but you know, that pain will get better over time. But yeah, we're at the bleeding edge of the next wave of innovation, in my opinion. Um, and I'm I'm super stoked about it. Like I said before, because, okay, the internet was, for a long time, there was this assumption that payments were hard, right? Because in the beginning of the internet, there was no way to pay people. The only way to do it is with credit cards. We require a trusted right. third party. Merchants end up getting chargebacks, meaning that um, the the credit card company claws back money that the, that the merchant thought they were going to get, Right. Users have to plug in all this information. It's a pain. You got to pay a fee on top of all this. Yeah. You got to pay a fee on top of all of this other stuff. So because payments were so hard, you have centralization and you have paying with your attention. So the the uh, Googles and the Facebooks of the world became large because they became the attention magnet. Everybody's attention is in the same place and they can package and resell that attention to advertisers. Podcasters like yourself, in order to make money, they... They show, they talk about advertising, right? It's, it's, it's the way of the way everything was all of that centralization. The fact that all of your money goes to Amazon, the fact that they get all your business, the fact that, um, all of your attention goes to Google and their ads, all of that is predicated on the assumption that payments are hard. It's hard to make a payment once and go away. Lightning breaks that assumption. It is now easy using lightning and increasingly with Sphinx to make a payment once and just, and so what that means is that the next generation of you know, big tech companies are going to be entirely based on this new paradigm, in my opinion. Like, and yeah. where we're at is the very That's beginning awesome. of it. It's, yeah, it's really exciting, really exciting. So, uh, Jim, before we wrap up, I mean, um, what would you say? I mean, first of all, to my listeners, uh, any kind of suggestions or anything you know important we we might have missed out or or not you know not did did we mention everything? And then the second thing would be, what would you address, you know, to the to the Sphinx developers or you know the team working in the background? Any kind of you know proposal, suggestions, ideas? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So <clears throat> I think if people want to use Sphinx, I would recommend you know to give it a try, but treat it like any other any other thing. It's experimental. It's like this is new, um, you know, it's growing pains, and just just expect that. I have used. Uh, clients that they make the hosted clients those are custodial so they're handling your sats on your behalf but you can make payments out and you can receive payments in so it's kind of like setting up a little wallet with a little bit of liquidity in and out um i i don't have any financial relationship to Sphinx. i used it it seems to work for me i'm going to continue to use it i also run my own my own relay which i also use over https um, I think I would warn users that if your node is only accessible over Tor, you're going to have to proxy that somehow, whether it's through Orbot or some other proxy type service until they implement that in the core. I would recommend that, uh, you know, to the degree that they have capacity to do so, they should integrate Tor directly in their clients. Yeah. Um, accepting, of course, that that's, it's, it's not necessarily easy. I don't know how hard it is, but... <laughs> Uh, on the face of it, it looks like it would be relatively difficult. Um, as a as a uh, a person trying to use their APIs, um, the most frustrating thing for me has just been uh, the documentation. But it's also a brand new thing. Like it's it's really just brand new. But even reading the source code, like the parameters aren't documented. There's no comments describing how anything works. So really it's a lot of reverse engineering, like just trying to figure out how everything works. So my client library is just copiously documented as I, as I figure out what their APIs are, I'm, I'm documenting them, but um, that would be my request would just be like, just put some code comments in there so that somebody who comes along later, you know, can <laughs> figure out what's going on. But I understand that my needs are uh, relatively minor compared to, compared to what other people need. All right, great. So, uh, Jimbo, where can people find you? Uh, tell, yeah, uh, a link maybe, or I'm going to can, can put that up in the show notes um, about your book. 
or oh yeah yeah if you want to search for my book uh, it's called orange coin good it's on amazon um i think it's pretty great it took me a long time to write it um but uh if people want to find me and talk to me i'm at jimbo coin on twitter uh same handle on telegram um and i guess there's no way to find me on sphinx because you have to uh <laughs> you have to have somebody's public key to chat them on there so but i'm on sphinx too if you want to chat with me on there yeah people can dm you yeah that's awesome jimbo so thanks so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge hope we can you know hope we can see each other sometime in person <laughs> maybe yeah me too once this whole COVID bullshit is over you know at some kind of little small conference or or meetup <laughs> that would be great. yeah it's yeah it's coming to an end pretty soon i've never been to europe uh that sounds fun the most foreign place i've ever been is canada and uh mm -hmm. Boy, the culture shock was just immense <laughs> coming from the US. So, <laughs> all right. So, have a great weekend, Jimbo. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. See ya. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Hey, how'd you, how'd you like this episode? Hope you enjoyed this. I know a lot, a part of it were, to be honest with you, over my head a little bit, but Jimbo did a great job in explaining things and uh, the suggestions he made also, you know, not only for the users, for the average, for, for you, for the listeners, but also, you know, maybe for the team of Sphinx Chat, for the developers, some kind of suggestions, proposals, ideas, uh, constructive ideas um, to, you know, improve uh, the functionality, the, uh, the operation, the, the user friendliness. So hope you enjoyed this. Let me know if you have any questions, suggestions. Uh, my DMs is open. Make sure you follow Jimbo on Twitter and subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platform. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. I'm the host of the Cave on the Vani Connection Show. And if you have any suggestions for any other tutorial, let me know. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you.